Hello everybody, Cam Sweet here from the Garage Connection coming to you with another video on our Chinese Mini Activator here. So what this video is going to be about is a, a deep, deep dive into the hydraulic pump and why you cannot make your tracks go any faster. This seems to be a common complaint on the machines. It's slower than hell. What do I do? How do I get to my job site? Do I have to trailer it? Uh, so we're going to talk about that as well as basically a complete breakdown of the hydraulic pump on your machine so stay tuned so prior to the start of this video what i did is i removed the hydraulic pump i went ahead and capped off the lines here and uh and just got everything kind of out of the way so we can take the pump apart i also have capped off my return line at the tank so that way it doesn't leak everywhere and this should get us set up to take a good look at what's going on with the pump and how it mounts and all that. So before I get too far into this, I do want to talk about uh, actually being able to drain the oil out of this thing. So this is the fill cap. Uh, there's no mystery there. But what I want to point out is if you take this cap off, okay, first off, you want to, and hopefully every machine is doing this correctly, this is the cap, okay? That's just an adapter that threads down into your fill tank. You want to make sure that this is nice and tight. This O-ring is really what's doing the sealing for you. However, if you take a standard shop vac hose and you put it over the top of this, it kind of fits down inside this, this recessed portion here. You shove the shop vac over there, you turn the shop vac on. Then what happens is when you go and loosen up your fitting that goes back to your hydraulic tank. Okay, let me get the formal funnel out of the way. We see here, this is coming right from the tank. There is no valve and goes up into this fitting and then it would go into the hydraulic pump. When you crack this loose with the vacuum on, no fluid comes out, okay? It's a very controlled, easy process, and it allows you to either put a cap on it or take this hose and guide it into a bucket and not get hydraulic oil all over your floor. All right, so I've taken the hydraulic pump out here. I already cracked it loose, okay? What I wanna talk about is this coupling, all right? This is the engine side, okay? We've got a keyway here, and this coupling comes apart like so, okay? There, notice there is no set screw at all holding this onto the engine. It just slips on there as it slips out of my hand. Okay, the keyway does come out nice and easily. And then on the opposite side, we have this part right here. This is the adapter that's gonna go into your hydraulic pump. Now this right here is commonly referred to as a Lovejoy coupling. That is the company that makes it. Think of it as a Kleenex versus a tissue. We're all talking about the same thing. Now, Lovejoy couplings are fantastic couplings. They are there to dampen down vibration between the engine as it's driving and the pump as it's being turned through the use of this little isolator right here. Okay, this part sometimes wears out, but beyond that, it's pretty much maintenance free. Okay, they do sell new uh, urethane inserts for these things. To rebuild them if you have a severe amount of hours on yours but other than that you really should never have to worry about this now on this side of it we do see some splines cut in here all right this this pump is driven off of these splines there is no set screw or anything that holds it in there everything is just off the contact between the pump splines and this coupler when you put these things together they do make a fantastic pair. So here we have our hydraulic pump from our Agrotech H12 mini excavator. Now this pump is what's referred to as a group two hydraulic pump, and it has an SAE number two flange on it. So if you were looking up how to source this pump, you type in group two hydraulic pump, or you type in SAE number two hydraulic pump, and this is gonna come up. This pump is a very simple pump. It really only has two moving parts and it comes apart very easily. What we're gonna do is take it apart now and show you some of the different things inside of it. Now these bolts need to be torqued down very tightly. I've already broken them with an Allen wrench. We're gonna pull these out. The first thing we have here is our end covers. Now, 
There's a couple different styles of these, okay? Some of the higher end pumps like your Eaton's, your Dan Fosses, things of that nature, they're gonna have a cast iron end plate. And obviously some of the import models here are gonna have this cast aluminum end plate. Now it's very important when you take this end plate off, you notate which end is in versus out because it goes back on either way, okay? In this pump's case, I know that this is the inlet and this is the outlet. We got this, we're gonna take this off right here. The next part we have is the actual pump body, okay? Once you take the bolts out, this end plate comes loose and this front part is gonna come loose. We'll pull this off, we'll leave it to the side for a minute, we're gonna talk about this. What we have here is the end insert inside of this external gear pump. If I turn the splines, you can see that the wheels turn, okay? And they turn opposite direction of one another, all right? Now this pump, when, when you buy these pumps or you source them, they all have a couple different things. They have the information for the input spline, they have the information for the pump displacement, and they have the rotator. Now inside here is where everything really is going on, okay? The first thing that you gotta take a look at, on this end kind of insert here, and this one, you see that we have an O-ring right here, or, a, or a, I guess you'd call it a gasket, it's not really an O-ring. And then we have two channels cut out on this end. We have those same channels cut out on this end, okay? This area of the pump is the suction side. As the fluid comes in, it inevitably gets around the gears, and this little voided area with these little channels cut into it are there to relieve the leakage around the spinning gears on either side of the pump as the shaft spins and vent that pressure back into the suction side to get reused in the pressure side right. of the system. Now if you notice on this side, there is no cutout. We see, you can clearly see right through it, but there's no cutout for these. This is because this is the pressure side and this is the suction side. If you had a way for this fluid to get out, you would not build any pressure, okay? Now if you push in on this, Thing, you can actually pop out this end piece. All right, again, I, I showed you, or I explained about these little, little bushings. We see another cutout here for additional oiling. We're going to put this to the side. We're going to talk about these gears, right? This is what's called a external gear pump. So we have two gears, they are meshing together, and the way this pump is turning, what happens is, as the gears come around, they grab some of the hydraulic fluid, and they trap the fluid between the gear and the outside of the pump housing. So as the pump is turning, that fluid is trapped. It eventually is pushed around and into the pressure side. And when it gets to the pressure side, as these gears start to mesh again, the fluid can no longer go between them. So it is forced out the discharge side and goes to work in our hydraulic system. We're going to take it a step further. We're actually going to pop the drive gear out and what's called the driven gear. We're going to look inside of the pump housing even more. This insert comes in and out exactly like the other one does, okay? And it's very difficult to see, but, and I hope I'm getting it. Let me make sure I'm getting this. You can see in here that there is a clear area that the gears have been running against. And then we have this kind of smooth area where there's no evidence that there's been any movement. All right, this is extremely important to keep in mind in your hydraulic system. If you do not maintain your system properly, any particles that get inside your fluid are going to wear at your pump housing. And what's gonna happen is you will open up the tolerance between the gears as they run around this housing and the fluid will start to slip through the gaps and you will start to see decreased performance from your hydraulic system. Now, when I put this center piece back on the end mount, we're looking at the parts information here. I've tried looking this up, it doesn't really mean anything, but I do wanna point out something. We know this is the inlet, we know this is the discharge, okay? So the force is all gonna be on this end. And essentially it's gonna be trying to drive the gears this way through their little bearings because the fluid over here is pushing against the gears. If you take a look at this pump, you can see there's a significant amount of discoloration and wear on this side. 
and relatively little on this side. I mean, there's a little bit in there. It's tough to see, but you can clearly see evidence of the force that's pushing these gears this way to escape that fluid pressure. Now, my pump, my engine only has, my machine only has five or six hours on it. And already we're starting to see evidence of wear in our hydraulic system. This is why it's extremely important with these machines to add a filter to your system. What we're going to do now, I'm going to put this pump back together um, just to get it you know, off the table here. And then we're going to talk about the reason why we can't make our, our drive wheels go any faster with this type of hydraulic pump. Let's throw this thing back together. I'm going to go back after we get done talking about this pump before I put it back in and torque these bolts in accordance with their uh, recommended torque values. So let's talk about replacement of this pump. Okay, let's say this pump goes bad and you got to get a new one. We already talked about you search for group two pump with an SAE number two flange. The next information that you need to know is your input. Okay, you got to count the teeth on this. So we go around here and we go get a little, get a little screw. Okay, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine spline. Very good. Nine spline, and you need to measure the diameter of it. Now, this is where it gets a little bit weird. Most of the diameters are going to be in American Imperial measurements. So you have to go across the splines and count how many eighths of an inch the input is. In this case, we're looking at one, two, three, four. This looks to be about a five eighths input. So five eighths, nine spline, group two with an SAE number two flange. The next information you need is what size your inlet and outlet is. Now, this one is going to be very machine specific, okay? These are DIN fittings. This is a uh, DIN, I think it's a 15L on in and out of this, but it's not going to be a DIN fitting into this pump body. Normally, it's either a BSPP, British uh, Pipe Parallel, or it's an SAE straight flange, okay? You got to figure out which one is applicable to your machine and match your pump appropriately. Okay, to fully understand what's going on here, you're gonna need some information, all right? First thing you're gonna need is this chart. This is what's called a hydraulic uh, fluid flow velocity chart. There's a bunch of different names for them. Essentially, we have three scales on here, okay? We got flow rate, hose bore, and flow velocity. Now, flow velocity is the speed at which the fluid comes through the hose. All right, hose bore obviously is our hose size. We have our dash sizes over here. And then flow rate, we got gallons per minute or liters per minute. And over here we have I don't care is per minute. Okay, you're going to need this. And you're also going to need to know number one is your hose sizes running to your drive motors. And the second thing is your pump flow rate. Okay. Now I have some of this information written down on this manila folder here. All right, so let's go ahead and go through this. The pump displacement, that is 6.8 milliliters per revolution of the pump. That's how much fluid the pump will move per revolution. Our rated RPM is 3,600 RPM. You put all that together and you're coming up with basically 24 and a half liters per minute. Now, we can keep that number or we can convert it to GPM. It does not really matter. They are the same value. So with this information right here, we know our flow rate, okay? Specifically, because we're not really doing anything when I'm moving our excavator. We just normally have both of the drive motors engaged and we're just going along trying to get wherever we gotta go. The next information that you need to determine how to solve your, your slow, slow excavator problems is gonna be your drive motor type, okay? These excavators have what's called a BM6 style drive motor, or at least the H12 does, and it model, the model number is 310cc. This is the displacement of the drive motor, okay? Using this information, what it allows you to do is pull up a chart that has all the different uh, speeds of that motor at a given flow rate and a given pressure to that motor. So we're going to pop that up right now. 
and we're going to take a look at the chart and we're going to assume that there is no load on your excavator motor. You're just going along, everything's fine. So we're gonna shoot for the maximum amount of RPM out of that motor at the flow rate. We talked about what our pump flow rate is to each wheel. It is approximately 3.23 GPM per wheel. We have that information written right here, 3.23 GPM per wheel. Now I understand that the motor chart only goes as low as four gallons per minute. So let's go ahead and use that. And it gives us a value of 47 revolutions per minute of that motor at zero load, full flow. We know the size of our drive wheel, it's 11 inches because I just measured it. You put all that information together and it gives you a ground speed of 1.538 miles per hour. Pretty much exactly what the manufacturers say, about a mile and a half per hour, okay? If you went only one levering gauge and you gave it the full 6.46 gallons per minute at 3600 RPM, you see here that there's not really a value listed. We will go ahead and estimate the next highest value, okay? When you translate that information into here, you're really not seeing that dramatic of an increase in RPM. If we put that data in, let's see here, max RPM at, let's just call it eight GPM. I know we can't get to eight, but let's call it GPM, all right? It gives you a value of 96 RPM. When you plug that into your speed calculator, you get 3.14 miles per hour. So you are officially going pi, okay? Now given this information, even if you basically doubled the amount of flow coming out of your excavator, it would only yield you a mile and a half increase in your excavator speed, all right? Let's just say you wanted to do that. You wanted to get it up to 3.14 blistering miles per hour. Let's talk about all the hurdles you'd have to jump through to get it that. The first step in that process would be ensuring that we can deliver the correct flow rate up into our directional control valve manifold here. Now this hose is a dash eight hose. The return is a dash 10 hose. So we are good up to this point. However, this does not tell us everything. We also have to get the fluid down to the drive motors. These directional control valves have a very large fitting and then it is stepped down to an 8L style DIN hydraulic connection. So you would have to take off your drive motor hydraulic lines. You'd have to take these fittings off and the ones down below and upgrade them to a full half inch style hydraulic line all the way down to your hydraulic swivel. The next part of your totally not worth it upgrade would be your actual swivel down here. Now this swivel is appropriately sized to flow the amount of fluid through it going to your drive motors. So you'd have to take this swivel out. You'd have to special order one that has the appropriate dash eight connections to ensure that you can stuff eight gallons a minute through those hoses down to your drive motors. And the last part of your thing, your last part of your upgrade here would be to go ahead and remove these dash four hoses and replace them with the bigger half inch sizes. Now this would involve finding the correct fitting to go from these hydraulic motors into the dash eight hoses. So you have to pull these off, figure out that thread, figure out how to step it up to the dash eight, and then that would complete your upgrade to double the speed of your mini excavator. Going back to our chart here, okay, we're gonna pretend that we doubled our flow rate. We are now flowing eight gallons per minute. Right there, that's eight, okay? And we know we wanna remain in the correct flow velocity for a pressure line. So what we have to do is, we have to take our straight edge here, we have to go across eight in the middle of our pressure line and see where that tells us that our hose size needs to be. All right, we're basically at a dash eight. We're basically at a half inch hose size, all right? 
So that would be the hose size that we would need to use to maintain correct flow velocity with the correct amount of gallons per minute coming out of our pump. One thing you cannot overcome is your pressure relief valve. All right, this is something that is a problem on these excavators, especially the ones without hydraulic coolers, and I'm gonna explain why. We have our pressure coming in here. The first thing this pressure does when it comes out of the pressure hose is it enters this, this end of our manifold, and it distributes itself all the way down the directional control valves in the middle of them, waiting to be able to go to work in our hydraulic lines. If none of these valves are open, the pressure also hits up against our pressure relief valve and it lifts the seat from the spring pressure and it will vent the excess flow out this return line and back to our hydraulic tank. Whenever this valve is venting, not only is it wasted energy, it's also heat buildup in our hydraulic system. Right? You're putting the fluid through a tremendous amount of stress going through this pressure relief valve. Now that heat, unfortunately, has nowhere to go once it gets back to the hydraulic tank because these machines don't have coolers and it's a known issue that they get really, really hot and sometimes boil the fluid. So you're taking a problem that you currently have and basically making it twice as bad by upgrading this to a larger style hydraulic pump. When you put all these things together, it's really not worth it to go through all the hassle of upgrading the pumps, all the lines, the hydraulic swivel, all the different fittings, just to make your machine still go really freaking slow, okay? The only situation that I would consider doing a meaningful upgrade to one of these machines is to dedicate one of the hydraulic pumps, so you'd have to go ahead and put a tandem pump on, but dedicate one of those pumps specifically to the auxiliary hydraulics or what's called the, uh, the third function, okay? If you did that, you would have to locate a different DCV setup to ensure that you could control just the flow out of that second pump. But it would allow you to run your attachments that require a much higher flow velocity. So think of things like stump grinders, maybe a uh, sickle bar mower, snow blower, you know, whatever crazy thing they come up with next. That'd really be the only situation where you would want to dedicate, you know, a second pump to it and, uh, and, and really go through all the hassle. Um, some of the mini skid steers actually have triple pumps, okay? They have one pump dedicated to the lift, they got another pump dedicated just to the drive, and they have a third pump dedicated to the auxiliary hydraulics. They're built that way on purpose, okay? You don't have the size uh, area inside your engine compartment to accommodate this type of an upgrade. You definitely don't have the oil cooling or the filtration that you need to go ahead and run the system. When you put it all together, you're gonna have so much money in the thing, you probably should have just bought a commercial excavator anyways, all right? So I hope that this video helps you out understanding a little bit more about your hydraulic pump specifically, how it works, the internals, and why your machine is so damn slow. I promise we are gonna get into the installation of the cooler. I've got some parts in, I'm still waiting for some to show up to really finish out this installation like I want. And I'm actually hoping to offer kits that are completely bolt in, ready to go. You don't need to do anything at all except connect everything, turn the machine on, and go piss your wife off by digging holes in the backyard. All right? Cam Sweet from the Garage Connection. Please like and subscribe to the channel. Subscribe to the channel. I want to bring a lot more stuff to you on these machines. Have a great night.